All right, guys, what's going on? Welcome back to the Everything College Bowl podcast. Today, me and Nick here, we're doing our reaction to Mario Cristobal parting ways with Josh Gaddis, opting to go in a different direction at the offensive coordinator position following a uh, Druid first season together. Uh, you know, I was excited for Miami last year, Nick. I really thought they assembled a nice power staff. Cristobal comes in, of course, brings in Kevin Steele on the defense, and then the Boyles Ward winner from Michigan. Of course, uh, early February of last year, Gaddis left. Michigan, surprisingly, for the Hurricanes after, you know, we thought Jim Harbaugh was a lock for the Minnesota Vikings head coaching job. He decided to come back shortly after Gaddis was gone, and a lot of that, he said, was the administration did not treat him fairly. You know, I'm not exactly sure the whole story on that. I think that, you know, maybe some false promises were made, and, you know, it was kind of an ordeal that happened last year, and here we are again, late in the coaching carousel. Miami parts ways with Gaddis, you know, 367 yards per game, uh, only 23.6 points per game. Those are both 10th in the conference. Coming into the year, Tyler Van Dyke, Nick, this guy was supposed to be a superstar. End of the year, point 10 touchdowns and five picks, 63% completion rate. He was one of PFF's top 10 quarterbacks coming into the year after a very strong debut season under center for the Hurricanes. And this past season, it was a complete opposite. I think it's really underrated how bad he was because Brendan Armstrong at Virginia was supposed to be just as good. And he was terrible, and I think he got a lot of the attention. Uh, but now they're kind of in an interesting situation. Van Dyke coming off a very sluggish year. Jay Garcia is now entering the transfer portal. Um, you know, I want to kind of get your thoughts on this, Nick. Do you think uh, Cristobal opted to make a change because the offense was bad last year? Or do you think that he thinks that Gaddis no longer fits the vision uh, with, you know, because they did a lot of good work this offseason in the uh, portal and recruiting on the offensive line. It's crazy to say that because Michigan two years ago had such a great rushing attack with Gaddis at the helm. But do you think that he potentially does not fit the vision of what Cristobal wants to get back to? It was shocking that Gaddis. Yeah, I, yes, this offense was poor, but Gaddis seemed like a hormone high. You know, had a good time at Vanderbilt with James Franklin. Then he followed Franklin to Penn State, where he was the passing game coordinator. Spent a year at Alabama with as a co-offensive coordinator with Mike Loxley, of course, who now is coaching at Maryland. Then he did the, the years at Michigan, you know, won the, Bro the Broyles Award, was a fantastic coordinator there. Great running game as Michigan kind of really started to turn the corner here. And he got hired at Miami. It seemed like a hormone hire for Mario Cristobal. First season in, in Miami just was a terrible disaster by all expectations you know five and seven overall in the offense not producing van dyke regressing heavily i think is definitely the key to this puzzle here is really the problem for gaddis quarterback play was poor you know 60 percent completion percentage 10 touchdowns to five interceptions just poor numbers the running game was not great either i mean henry Parrish jr was leading the leading the way for the run on the running game with only 600 yards in the season 4.7 yards per carry only four scores for him you know, the rest of the running back play was not impressive. These guys, you know, below 400 yards for the most part. So I think Gaddis ends up getting fired because, you know, Miami long-term, they're going to be fine, right? They have great recruiting. They're bringing in tons of talent. Mario Cristobal is a fantastic coach. And the NIL money in, my, in South Florida is ridiculous, right? They have a great deep donor pool of alumni, you know, who are very, very wealthy. A lot of fans who donate. This is a huge program on a national scale, a very well-known program that's going to continue to pour money into their NIL funds and, over the next four to five years, they're going to start dumping a ton of money to this. I think Cristobal, you know, just saw that Gaddis didn't fit the vision. Probably going to go with someone who's more, you know, exciting coordinator is going to be kind of in the passing game, potentially kind of develop a, you know, more passing focused offense potentially and kind of develop and try to lure recruits to South Florida with the, you know, the promise of winning ACC titles, going back to the playoff because Miami, they should be able to compete with the money they have and with the coaching staff they have. I think the vision's going to be more about the running game. That's what Oregon won with was up front, downhill running toughness. Of course, they'd also had a great quarterback in Justin Herbert as well to headline his tenure. So I definitely could see that because I think Cristobal is going to implement his vision regardless. But if you can bring in a guy, like you said, that can you know kind of teach his offense how to air it out the right way, that's where you're going to get that superstar balance from. That's what they had with the Ducks. Very great teams uh, a couple years back. This is a team that had 98 yards against Clemson, Nick, and then 188 against Florida State in the same month. Both of those games were 30-point losses. Uh, by the Hurricanes. Uh, this is a team that could not keep up with Middle Tennessee early on in the year. Only scored nine points on the road against Texas A&M. We ended up having a really good defense. Um, you know, I think it's kind of embarrassing when you see they scored 70 points on Bethune-Cookman, and then the rest of the year, they topped the 30-point mark, I think, just three times. Uh, you know, what do you think this means to have this fire happen this late, though? Why did it not happen a couple of months ago? Because like I said, in the final month of the year, the offense was pathetic. They did absolutely nothing. Uh, I mean, 385 against Pitt, blowout loss. They uh, had 353 and, you know, a double-figure win over Georgia Tech. 
Uh, but I mean, that's about it. They had the one win, but even when they were winning, they had no production. From October 22nd onwards, the most they had was that 385 blowout garbage time loss to Pittsburgh. So why do you think this happened now and it didn't happen a couple weeks ago? I think there might be some panic going on currently in South Florida. We've seen a lot of high-profile programs recently, you know, firing offensive coordinators and hiring high-profile Clemson. Of course, hired Garrett Riley. Alabama's now looking for an offensive coordinator. Other big programs are firing corners. I think Miami just is getting a little worried. I think they planned on holding on to Gaddis for the for, for the uh, long term. I think he was at least going to get one more season. I think Mario Cristobal and his staff might have panicked a little bit and saw what was going on in college football, how a lot of big programs are making big changes and bringing in different coordinators. And I think they kind of got scared and were like, we need to hustle this out of here and try to find something quickly. And it, I think it's too late. They should have probably made a move earlier on in the offseason, probably, you know, right after the regular season ended before, you know, bowl season, since Miami wasn't involved in bowl season, they probably they could have done something there and made a move they needed to make. I think this is just to set this team back a little bit. And speaking of some potential candidates here, we got a nice little list put together. Uh, Jeff Scott, former USF head coach, obviously did not do very good there, which, I mean, it's going to be a tough, tall task for anybody there. But if people uh, can remember, he was a heck of an offensive play caller for Clemson many years back. This is still a young guy at 42 years old. Um, he's back at Clemson now as an offensive analyst, and he's helping in the recruiting department as well. But from 2000, and 8 to 2019, he was on this Clemson staff. He was the co-offensive coordinator from 15 to 19 before bolting for South Florida. But um, I think Jeff Scott, this is a guy that's going to come in if they can bring him back from Clemson. I think right now is probably the spot he wants to be in. I think this would be an overall solid fit for Jeff Scott. But I think more importantly, Marcus Ario, he's my prediction to land this job. He's got plenty of repertoire with Mario Cristobal. This is a guy that was offensive coordinator at Oregon. He, I think, undeservably got fired at UNLV. Zero wins his first year. Two years later, they're at five and seven. That's the exact type of progression you're looking for. Uh, they had two wins in his second season. So each year, UNLV got better. A school like that should not be firing a guy who almost got them to a bowl. So I think it was absolutely ridiculous that he got fired. There's no reason for that. But um, he was on the coaching staff from 2017 to 19, the co-offensive coordinator, worked with the QBs and the tight ends. Uh, and then he was, I think, the sole uh, OC in 2018. Uh, and then 19, of course, as well during that great year. So I think Ario, he's going to fit the bill here. He knows exactly what Mario wants to do. I think he wants to keep this staff together. He had at Oregon because there was a lot of success. You know, he brought out Murrow Ball over as the offensive line coach. And I think reuniting this trio could really lead to a, some dominance up front for uh, Miami. I think that would be the best hire of the list that we have currently here. Yeah, I think he was certainly uh, fired prematurely at UNLV. I think, you know, Right, the overall record is not fantastic, seven and twenty-three. But considering the roster he inherited, and the fact that they had, like you said, zero wins, then two wins, then five wins, he was building something. Right, it was slowly, slowly, slowly coming close. They nearly got into a bowl game this past season. Now, I think this is this was a good opportunity for UNLV to continue with a head coach that was building something. They fire him too early, got happy feet, and now he finds himself in a position where he could take this job at Miami and go back to the guy that he coached under in the past. These those Oregon offenses were fantastic with Justin Herbert leading the way. I think this would be the best hire. I think he's got to take the job at this point. But Jeff Scott also is another one that interests me because Jeff Scott's resume at Clemson was fantastic, and he did really lead a Tigers team that was absolutely fantastic. We won national championships while in Clemson. So I think either of them would probably make the most sense for me right now. Uh, but there's some other names on the list that could also potentially work. Scott Frost, I think he's kind of lost his pedigree as an offensive play caller, considering how disastrous the tenure was at Nebraska, but maybe with less expectations and less to handle, maybe this is a guy that can really restore some faith in people as a great play caller. Uh, Dan Mullen, uh, you know, obviously was a bumpy end to his tenure at Florida. Uh, you know, it was just an unexpectedly disappointed final season from him, and he was ousted quickly despite beating Georgia, uh, you know, competing with the Bulldogs and Alabama on the field, so that was unfortunate to see. Uh, but I do think those are two underrated candidates who'd certainly make splashes. A lot of people are looking at James Conley, though, from Texas A&M. James Cooley, this is a guy that was at Georgia for a couple of years as a play caller before heading to A&M as more of a positional coach. But he was at Miami from 2013 to 15, was the offensive coordinator on that staff. And he knows Crystal Ball from the FIU days. He was the OC for him back in 2007. That was a long time ago. See, a lot of Miami fan pages are really trying to connect these two. Uh, you know, he was also... He's also a Miami, uh, you know, what's it called? He's a native from the South Florida area. So there's a handful of reasons that would connect him here. You know, he's worked, you know, he played at high school down there. He's worked down in Miami plenty of years at the high school ranks, college, NFL. So he's certainly very 
used to this area and of course the previous relationship from many years ago James Conley this is a guy they're going to certainly try to get in I think but um I don't know if this makes the most sense even though I mean the coaching resume is pretty impressive the ties for Conley certainly make a lot of sense you know coached at Miami senior high school as their quarterback coach in the late 90s then at Miami Norland high school where he was the associate head coach and the offensive coordinator for two years and then you know the time at FIU the time at Miami he also coached at Florida State's alma mater so he has tons of ties to the ACC and Florida as a whole and then you know was the co-offense coordinator then the offense coordinator at Georgia and now he's been at AM for the past two seasons that kind of took a demotion in my opinion going down to you know positional coaches I, I think it makes a lot of sense for Cooley and some regret regard because you know this is a guy that's got experience working at, at Miami he's got experience working with crystal ball so I think the relationship is there you know a good recruiter in the South Florida area, a fantastic recruiter in the South Florida area you know one of the best recruiters in college football in the past so I think he's got great ties great recruiting ties in Miami you know like I said earlier the NIL money is certainly flying into South Florida and they can recruit right this is a program that can recruit and bring talent and we've seen the class they've put together already under Cristobal early on so you get an even better recruiter on that staff a guy that knows the X's and O's of South Florida the ins and outs I think that would be a great recipe for success in South Florida now looking at a wild card candidate at the bottom of the list, Cliff Kingsbury. Obviously, he's going to be a candidate for a lot of jobs in multiple different leagues. Bit of a wild card because I don't think that he really fits the vision that Crystal Ball has of wanting the ground in town. But I certainly think if they really want to break college football, why not get a little complex and you know run an air raid with a lot of running? You know, I think this is something they could certainly do. A versatile scheme with plenty of explosiveness and plenty of that ground and pound and attitude that you're looking for. I think that could be something that's certainly interesting. Can Crystal Ball gamble on that though? You know, trying to implement his scheme with Kingsbury's, uh, you know, prolific air raid. I think it'd be certainly uh, fun to ponder. And I think it'd be a great hypothetical to think about, you know, but you know, I don't know, outside of a video game, I'm not sure if this makes a lot, whole lot of sense. I agree. This is more of a fun hypothetical thing about, I think Kingsbury just, I think that him and Crystal Ball would clash just too much potentially in their styles. And I think that this could lead to some issues in South Florida. Crystal Ball really can't gamble. You know, the leash is going to be short shorter than it probably should be for Mario Cristobal considering they just expect to be able to win immediately in Miami we, we I think in you know some of those schools in Florida I think you know, the University of Florida I think Florida State in the past I think Miami now you know there's short leashes for these coaches they got to start putting results on immediately and I think you can't afford to take a game ball, gamble on a coordinator that could be you know boomer bust Cliff Kingsbury could be a fantastic pick right and could lead them to a high-flying offense or it could always it could fall apart after two seasons and Miami's back at square one and Cristobal could be really shooting himself in the foot so I think it's best if he stays away from a gamble like that, just considering the volatile, you know, climate, so to speak, that it is down in South Florida with the University of Miami. Yeah, that's going to be it for today's episode. As always, Nick, I appreciate you joining me. This was fun. So I'm going to expect the news here at the end of January. Uh, but interesting to, you know, look at the situation. I did not tune into much Miami football this past year. I didn't even do much research on them for some reason. Uh, just something just seemed to be missing. And uh, I think this is pretty exciting to see them potentially go elsewhere and to see where Josh Gaddis maybe ends up as well. Yeah, it's interesting for Miami. You know, Miami has an interesting schedule coming up next year. They play AM at home. They play Clemson at home as well. They play the rest of their ACC games. They got a tough road trip to Florida State, tough road trip to North Carolina. So I'm excited to see what they do with this. I think Mario Cristobal is building something. He's going to get some more time to build something. But the leash is short, and they want results in South Florida as soon as possible. He's got to get a coordinator that can help him put those results on the field. They can also utilize the phenomenal offensive line they've built this offseason. Very excited to see how they do in the trenches. So, it's me for today's episode, guys. Make sure you like, comment, subscribe. See you next time.